this is in, in this session, once again, we're going to flip the order. So the commentator, Mike Ramsey, is going to talk first, and then Garrett Epps is going to respond to him. Uh, all right. Uh, well, uh, since I have the podium, uh, the, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, say a big thank you, and I hope you'll all join me, to uh, Mike Rappaport, who has been the, the motive force on this conference. Thank you, of course, to all the other people who have made this possible, and, uh, and thank you for all coming. Uh, so, uh, and, and I, I regret to say that, uh, that you have to listen to me, because uh, we, we had planned for John McGinnis to give this, uh, this comment, but he was unable to make it for, uh, for medical reasons. So, so I have, uh, I've stepped in, and that, that excuses uh, my complete lack of preparation. Uh, but I am happy to be giving a talk on, on this uh, on this topic, because uh, uh, as a sort of uh, version of applied originalism, I guess I would call it, it's, uh, it's closer to the kind of things um, that, that I particularly like to do. Um, and uh, so, uh, so this is a particular interest to me, and also because at least once I'm done with it, it's going to raise uh, issues of uh, international law and uh, uh, matters arising nearer the founding, uh, so that I don't have to talk about the 14th Amendment, something I don't know anything about. Uh, but anyway, uh, to give a quick, uh, just a quick summary of, of the paper, which I, I think is just an outstanding paper, uh, addresses, of course, a, uh, a, a significant and discrete issue um, of, of great importance today, and that is the question of whether uh, the children of illegal aliens born in the United States uh, are citizens uh, by virtue of... of uh, the uh, Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says uh, that everyone born in the United States um, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof uh, is a citizen. And since um, the class in question is obviously born in the United States, the only question is whether they are subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Uh, and uh, as I'll try to say in a moment, uh, the way I see the question framed uh, is really um, whether that language should properly be read to, to say subject to the exclusive jurisdiction thereof, um, because that seems to me to be the only textual way um, to exclude the, uh, the children of, uh, uh, of illegal aliens. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that um, in a minute. Uh, so um, the paper uh, principally addresses the uh, legislative history, as it promises, uh, that is what the, um, the framers of the 14th Amendment were thinking uh, in terms of the meaning of the Citizenship Clause. Uh, and I think, although it has many good points, I think that the two that, that, are, that, that stand out for me as, as uh, most decisive um, are, first of all, um, it seems fairly clear that the framers uh, assumed that the children of legal Chinese immigrants uh, would be citizens under this clause. And that was a non-trivial question at the time uh, because there was already getting to be some serious tensions over immigration, legal immigration, but immigration uh, of Chinese in California in particular. Um, and so in that sense, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Wong Kim, Kim Ark uh, appears to be consistent with this understanding. Um, the second point that I, where I think this paper makes a, a very huge contribution is uh, in talking about um, the status of the tr Indian tribes in the West at the time and how that this was a very significant issue uh, for the framers because there were a significant number of tribes um, who were not under the practical control of the United States, uh, either because um, they were militarily not yet subjugated um, or because they, were, uh, they had entered into treaties uh, which gave them really substantial uh, independence and uh, 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 relief from U.S. sovereignty to an extent, I think, that's not comparable today. They, these were very, very far-reaching treaties in terms of recognizing the, the de facto independence of, uh, of the tribes. Uh, and so this shows at least one very significant uh, thing that the clause did uh, that wouldn't reach uh, the children of illegal aliens, but it excluded the children of uh, the Indian tribes that fell into this category. Not, not all Indians, but the, the Indians that were really, as the clause said, beyond the jurisdiction of the United States. 
Uh, so that, those seem the most conclusive arguments to me in the paper, although there are obviously some other uh, excellent ones as well. And this all seems right, and I, I must say I'm absolutely thoroughly persuaded by this, uh, indeed persuaded to the point that I think this, this uh, question, this, this topic poses a question um, for those who think that uh, originalism cannot reach definitive conclusions um, on matters of um, modern import, because I think here it really does seem like it does, and so it, it presents quite starkly the question of, are we going to be bound by this decision, um, which was made, by the way, um, by people who had no knowledge of the present question we face. That's what I think is particularly interesting about it, is there were no illegal aliens at the time, so they were not thinking specifically about the question of uh, the... Uh, uh, the citizenship of the children of illegal aliens. Nonetheless, the language seems to me um, quite clearly to encompass it. Uh, and the question is whether we should regard ourselves as bound by that, as some people, including Judge Posner, <coughs> excuse me, have suggested that we shouldn't be. Um, but uh, on, on the point of the paper, uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly persuaded by what it says. And of course, I'm then perhaps tempted just to sit down at that point. Um, but uh, it would not be... Uh, consonant with the, uh, with the law professor's idea of uh, using all 15 of my 10 minutes um, to, uh, to say just a couple of other things. And the things I want to say are, are mostly methodological points. Um, and and I, in fact, I have three, and I will try to make them um, as quickly as possible. Uh, the, the first methodological point I have um, uh, is the question of the burden of proof. Now, like a good lawyer, uh, Professor Epps says the burden of proof is on the other side uh, to show that uh, the citizenship clause uh, does not encompass uh, the children of illegals. Um, well, maybe, but I think actually the question of burden of proof is a very difficult one and a very important one for originalists um, because uh, there are several ways you could allocate it. And if you think that um, originalism or, or, or originalist answers, well, not as indefinite necessarily as some people think, or at least very difficult, and, and uh, as, as I do, uh, then the question of who has a burden of proof becomes important. And I think that, that it actually could go a number of different ways. And I'm not even sure why the paper thinks the, the, the burden of proof is on the other side, um, other than, of course, that's where it should always be. Um, it seems to me that really when we're talking here about what would be an act of Congress declaring no citizenship for the affected class, that one might say the burden of proof is on the person asserting that that act of Congress is unconstitutional uh, and that, uh, therefore, um, it's us, uh, not, uh, not the other side, um, that has the burden of proof. Um, I suppose another way to look at it is that the burden of proof always should lie with Congress because Congress needs to show that its acts are constitutional. Um, and I think a third possibility, which perhaps is where the paper's going, although it doesn't say it straight up, um, but it's one I'm sympathetic with, is that the burden of proof should lie on the party that is asserting what seems to be contrary to the facial meaning of the language, uh, which is, is, I say, suggested in the paper, and that seems right to me, because it seems to me that just reading the text on its face, we say, are cho excuse me, children of illegals subject to the jurisdiction of the United States without the exclusive stuck in there, right? Um, it seems to me, well, it's on its face, it seems that the answer is yes. Um, of course, they, they can, as the paper points out, um, they can be sued, they can pros be prosecuted criminally, they could be arrested, uh, and, uh, and so forth, all things that we associate with jurisdiction. Um, so that, that's my methodological point number one. Methodological point number two is, how much should we care about whether the uh, answer that we get here um, is the right answer in some sort of moral or policy sense? And I think uh, the paper lets it not, does not disguise its view <laughs> that this is uh, indeed sort of a moral imperative. Uh, and indeed, the, uh, the other side comes in for um, what I would almost border on calling name-calling, uh, at, least, at least to the extent that one thinks nativist is a name-calling. Um, and I wonder um, whether that's really um, effective or whether the way, that's the way we ought to be thinking about originalist projects. Now, in a sense, of course, we always want to think that the framers are reasonable people. I am a reasonable person. Uh, I believe this. Therefore, the framers must have believed it. Uh, and since you're a reasonable person, you will also believe it. Um, but I wonder if we don't fall a little bit then into the, uh, the uh, danger that Don Dripps suggested earlier, um, that in fact it, it, it gives the appearance that we're using, uh, the, um, using the project simply to pursue what we've already decided is right on other 
grounds. And so I, I wonder if too strong a, a use of, uh, uh, of a uh, uh, moral support, in a sense, uh, doesn't undermine the, uh, the originalist point. Um, because I think it stands quite well um, on its own. Uh, without, uh, without reference to uh, what we think is right. And indeed, it may be the case that there are many people um, who don't share this moral intuition and yet would come to the conclusion, contra Don, um, that, uh, that sometimes originalism does lead you to the answers that you don't necessarily like. Um, and so the third, and the third thing I wanted to talk about um, and perhaps this is the, the most important, um, is, is to answer the question, when we're looking at a legislative history like this, um, what are we looking for? Um, and I think the paper is um, agnostic or, or um, perhaps of two minds on this, uh, because at times it seems like it is, um, it is pushing uh, very much the idea that, well, we're just trying to figure out what they meant by subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Um, but there are other times uh, when the paper uh, says things along the lines of, um, given what the framers of the 14th were trying to accomplish in terms of eradicating slavery in the subordinates class of, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the blacks, that they wouldn't have countenanced um, a interpretation of this language that would lead to another subordinate class, namely the subordinate class of, uh, of children of illegal aliens. Um, and uh, my inclination, of course, is very much to favor the former as opposed to the latter interpretation, particularly here, because um, I think it's, it's actually sort of ahistorical to talk about what the, uh, um, what the framers would have imagined on this, uh, on this point, because they didn't, as the paper says, didn't actually imagine anything because the issue simply wasn't in front of them and couldn't have been in front of them because they did not have the idea of, uh, of children of illegals. Um, so I actually think uh, 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 the paper will be strengthened somewhat, but again, this is my own biases coming through, by a, a, a somewhat more textual focus, and indeed a focus that set the framing back a little bit in time. Because I think one question is, how did people think before the 14th Amendment um, about the way this kind of language might be read? And I, and I wanted to um, bring, just so I could drag it back all the way to my period, um, I think a critical decision actually is the Supreme Court's decision in uh, Schooner Exchange versus McFadden in 1812, which was about jurisdiction, about jurisdiction over a, uh, uh, a foreign warship. But in the course of that decision, um, the court made some, um, some side points um, about, and it said, when th this is uh, more or less directly from the opinion, when private individuals of one nation spread themselves through another, as business or caprice may direct, uh, they are then, skipping a bit, uh, they are then amenable to the jurisdiction of that country. And so I think you see there the, the, the exact same kind of phrasing, um, that the jurisdiction of the country extends temporarily to people who are here um, on, indeed, in that situation, a non-temporary basis. And Marshall, who wrote the opinion, then goes on and gives some explanation for why that sort of jurisdiction um, is, uh, is perfectly compatible with international law um, and, uh, and, indeed, is sort of assumed because that's not what the case is about. He's saying, well, here's an example where we all agree that jurisdiction would exist. And so uh, I, I think that what that reinforces is that in order to get where you want to get, if you're on the other side of Professor Epps, is that uh, you need to insert that subject to the exclusive jurisdiction. Now, that would do it, because in the international law of the time, in the practice of the time, uh, the children of citizens born overseas were virtually unanimously, as far as I know, um, understood to be citizens of the foreign state. Uh, so the citizens of the, so the, the children of illegal aliens um, are not subject to the exclusive jurisdiction because they're subject to the citizenship ju jurisdiction as well of the foreign state. But with respect to the jurisdiction, simple, it seems quite clear. Uh, and then, uh, then I regard the legislative history as simply reinforcing that textual point that there was no hidden exclusive that should be read into this text. Uh, and instead, the text should be taken for what it just appears to say um, on its face. And uh, since I'm now well into my 15 minutes, uh, I'll uh, stop there. <laughs>